Okay, you have the recording. Hello, right? this is Gloria McMillan, and we are having our Tucson Hard Science SF group, and I'm going to ask everyone to please mute your, um, your microphones at this point, please. Um, this is a group that meets once monthly, and we are so thrilled we get to have so many wonderful speakers who are artists, writers, and scientists. And uh, this week, we are hosting David Gunkel and Ben Kuipers, who will be talking about aspects of the rights and responsibilities regarding robots. And it goes way back to Carl Chopek, RUR, and robots really being uh, realizing their power. So I think we can make a direct connection there. I hope that you will enjoy this talk because there are many connections for plot material for writers. One of the things I haven't said in our opening remarks is that we do this for writers. It isn't just a let's learn about science hour. It's so that people who write will feel more free to go back into science-based science fiction. It's not beyond us. Some people think it is nowadays. And with that said, I'm going to um, open this up and we will introduce our two speakers. I'll have to stop the screen. Okay, so for our two speakers this morning, we have David Gunkel, and I will let them each tell their affiliations and titles because I'm so hung up in all my technicalities here. It's going to be on me. But we have David Gunkel, and please mute all your microphones. I'm going to ask once again, everyone mute your microphones. I'm going to, I may have to mute one here. Let's see. Okay. Um, so keep those muted, please, while the while the speakers are talking. All right. And then I introduced David, and then I'm going to introduce Benjamin Kuipers. And I do know where you are, but I can't see it while I'm handling all these technicalities. So uh, please excuse me and know that I'm doing the best I can and just give your own uh, your credentials. We're so thrilled to have you this morning. Maybe I'll start in alphabetical order with David. Please finish telling about your, your credentials and everything. Thank you. All right, so I'll pick up the thread here and then try to fill in the blanks. Um, so I'm David Gunkel. I'm professor of communication and uh, technology at Illinois University in Chicago or just outside Chicago. And um, I really specialize in the ethics of emerging technology and have written, I don't know, a dozen books or so on the subject and uh, I'm looking really forward to uh, talking with all of you today. Um, I've done a lot of work with science fiction writers in the past um, and I always in the intersection of these topics, especially because a lot of the ethical issues really bubble up out of science fiction before they ever bubble up in uh, terms of science fact. So I think there's really a good uh, synergy between fiction and fact um, around these subject matters. And I'm very happy to share the stage or virtual stage with Ben, who I know from years ago, uh, way back in the Robo Philosophy uh, Conference Day. So. Um, and, and I'm Ben Kuypers. <clears throat> um, I think Gloria pronounced my name a little bit closer to the way we, it's pronounced in the Netherlands, which is Kuipers, but that's not an English vowel. And so my family has pronounced it with a long I, Kuipers, um, <clears throat> for the last four generations. Um, and I'm at the University of Michigan. I'm a professor of computer science and engineering, and I'm affiliated with the new robotics department there. Um, and <clears throat> I have basically spent my career doing artificial intelligence with a focus on common sense knowledge. And over the last number of years, I've been looking at ethics, um, treating, considering it as a domain of common sense knowledge, which is a, a type of knowledge that tells us what's okay to do and what's not okay to do. Um, and if we want to have intelligent robots, then that is a category of knowledge that they should have. And this raises a bunch of interesting questions. Um, now, I had the privilege of speaking to your group um, in early August, I believe. Um, and that was loads of fun. And now I get to share the stage with David. Um, we, uh, 
there was this wonderful robo philosophy conference uh, in which which country was that in? Uh, it, it was in Denmark. Denmark, that's right. Aarhus, yes. Good. But it was wonderful. Um, so why don't I turn the stage back over to David, and then um, when 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 he's done, I'll have a few things to say. But I think he's done more work on uh, robot personhood than I have. But I do have a few humble opinions here, <laughs> except for the humble part. Okay, so Gloria, how, how do you want to proceed here? Well, you know each other and you're comfortable working with each other. You can just outline it verbally right now how you want to do this. Uh, I think you know better than I do. Ben, um, have you a presentation prepared? I have, I have notes about stuff that I'd like to talk about. I don't have slides. Okay. I have a short slide thing that I can show if it helps, but I, I, I don't mind just, uh, you know, free, free forming it if, if, you know, if that's the way we want to do this. I'm adding you to who can share screens. So it's now on multiple, you can share. Okay. Um, but since I have the slides, I'll, I'll do it. Is that all right? Sure. Is that acceptable? Okay. So let, let's uh, proceed that way here and uh, see what we can do. Um, I will have to find my files. Well, I'll just I'll he'll, I'll do the the dead air while you're doing that, and That's I think right. this Thank is you. wonderful that we can do kind of an ad hoc, and people can build with what they feel more comfortable doing, and I know that uh, Ben will be able to find some highlights in his work as well. This is this is quite an opportunity, and I like to see I I like to see you on the spot. No, <laughs> that's not what I meant, and make you nervous because you didn't have this all. No, but um, this is this shows it's more like life. It's not like canned where everything is all perfect and we thought it all up in advance. I I knew that you two would work it out between yourselves how you would do this. And uh, Ben, uh, you know I know that you have some material if you want to do that while David is getting his, you know, just an introduction maybe to what you're going sure. to talk later. Well, the, as I understand it, part of, the, part of the, the, the point of the discussion is to talk about legal personhood. Um, well, not legal personhood, but robot personhood. So at what point do we consider a robot to be a person? Um, and <clears throat> There, I'll, I'll leave it to David to tell him more about the philosophical background of this, but one of the best presentations of this I have found is a particular Star Trek episode that many of you have probably seen called The Measure of a Man, where a distinguished roboticist uh, from the Starfleet Academy has orders to take Lieutenant Commander Data, who is an android, and... Um, bring him into his lab and take him apart and figure out how to duplicate him. And okay. so part of the problem is that um, Data was created by this amazing genius who then went and died. And so he is a unique creature, um, but he is unquestionably a robot. And um, he declines the honor of this um, um, opportunity. And <clears throat> um, they say, um, well, I'm sorry, you can't decline because you are equipment. You are not actually a person. And are not, he's, he's not allowed to reject the orders. Uh, he says, well, then I'll resign from Starfleet. And they say, well, you can't resign from Starfleet either, because you're equipment. And we can simply requisition you and do what mm -hmm. we need to do. And so they have a court case. And um, one of the other members of the, the, the crew is, is told to be the prosecutor and um, um, 
the captain is the defense, and they argue over whether data is a person and able to make a decision. Um, it's really, if you haven't seen it, and I suspect many of you have, um, it's very much worth finding and, and watching, called the, a measure, the Measure of a Man. Um, but of course, this is science fiction, and um, it's far in the future. Um, data is in this fictional universe, an intelligent robot, um, but he's far beyond what we're able to do right now. And so um, one question is, at what point do we start approaching um, the level of personhood that we see there? Um, now, one reference point that I think is interesting is, of course, we have decided that corporations are legal persons. But that's really very different. That's not the same as being a person like, um, like we are. Um, so legal personhood really just means um, that a corporation can enter into binding contracts. And so it can buy things, it can sell things, it can hire people, it can pay bills, it can do all of that sort of thing. Um, there's lots of other aspects of being a person that a corporation does not have the right to do, um, including vote in our elections or get married or do various other things. Um, now, the Supreme Court seems to be pushing it somewhat. Um, but there, there still are very strong limits and corporations are treated very differently. Um, corporations are not conscious. They're not even sentient. Sentient, by the way, seems to mean able to perceive sensations. Um, and um, now it's interesting when, when you reflect on evolution, um, Corporations are, in a very real sense, products of evolution. Um, and they are selected according to their success in their particular way of life. And it's pretty easy to expect that if an entity, a creature, is a product of evolution, that it's going to end up having a goal to survive because ones, <clears throat> you could have entities that don't have a goal to survive, but if they end up competing with ones that do have a goal to survive, the ones that do have the goal to survive are more likely to survive. Um, simply like agents that feel pain are more likely to survive than agents that don't feel pain because pain is a signal of potential damage to the organism and it alerts the organism to take action to avoid that. So we can expect that anything which is a product of evolution uh, beyond a certain point is going to feel pain. It's going to have a goal to survive. And so we can expect that um, corporations will have a goal to survive whether they feel pain, what, what corresponds to potential damage to the corporation is an interesting question. Um, but now that David's got his slides, um, let me turn it over to David. All right. So um, this I, I've gone for brevity here. So hopefully we can knock this off uh, pretty quickly and it won't be too uh, cumbersome. Um, but this is a, just a little presentation that I think will help set the stage for uh, the conversation and will follow very nicely from what uh, Ben has just introduced. So let me get my slides up and going again. Here we go. And I'm assuming everybody can see those. Is that correct? Okay, very good. So ethics in both theory and practice is really an exclusive undertaking. 
in confronting and dealing with others, we inevitably make a decision between who is morally significant and what remains a mere thing. So the question matters because it divides the world of entities into others who count as persons versus mere things that do not. And this division in person versus thing goes all the way back to the Romans with uh, the jurist Gaius, who introduced this dichotomy of the person versus the thing. And we codify it in our laws, but we also operationalize it in our moral systems. And we can see this really being uh, at play in our science fiction, because I think Mary Shelley in particular provides a very good example of where the challenge of the thing impinging on what could be a person is actually uh, in play and made available to us. So the real struggle within the novel Frankenstein is for the monster to be recognized by his father and for the father uh, Victor Frankenstein to uh, sort of want to hold the creature at bay and uh, not take responsibility for his creation. So the question that confronts Victor Frankenstein is actually a question that now confronts us as we are staring in the face of different capabilities with machine consciousness, if we want to call it that, or machine intelligence, however you want to define it. And that is whether these things are things or whether they become a kind of person. And so this tension between person and property, I think, is something that we now are confronting in the face or in the faceplate of various kinds of artifacts that of our own design. So this is not a question only of science fiction. It's a question that is now being confronted in science fact. And a really good example is what we saw um, happening not too long ago with the civil law rules of robotics introduced in the EU. So on the one side, you have the European Commission's resolution, which advised extending some aspect of legal personality to robots for the purpose of social and legal integration. On the other side of the debate, you had more than 250 scientists, engineers, and AI professionals who signed an open letter opposing the proposal, asserting that robots, AI, and other artifacts, no matter how autonomous or intelligent they are or might appear to be, are nothing more than mere things or objects. But I think what's important in this debate is not what makes the one side different from the other, but rather what both sides already share and must hold in common in order to have this debate in the first place, namely the conviction that there are two exclusive ontological categories that divide up our world into either persons or things. This way of organizing things is arguably arbitrary, culturally specific, and often inattentive to significant differences. So the question that is really on the table here is the status or standing of artifacts. And this has had a real polarizing effect because on the one side, there's what could be called the conservative faction, not in a political sense, but in the sense of seeking to conserve and preserve the status quo. According to this group, the very idea of robots, AI, or artifacts being accorded anything approaching moral or legal beyond that of a mere instrument or piece of property is not just wrong-headed thinking, but a dangerous development that should be severely curtailed or even shut down before it even begins. The other side, what we might call by way of contrast, the liberal faction, recognizes that various robotic devices and AI implementations might need some form of social protections and that ensuring this exigency is an important component of our ongoing efforts to test, validate, and even revive the limits of our moral and our legal systems. Now, the way this comes to be decided matters and will have lasting consequences, obviously. On the one hand, it has been argued that granting technological artifacts the status of person would be not just similar to the extensions of legal personality to corporations in the era of industrialization, but it would be significantly worse. Doing so, it is argued, would allow for virtually perfect shell companies that could be used to shield bad actors and human beings from taking responsibility for their decisions and their actions. On the other hand, there are seemingly good and very practical reasons for extending social considerations to robots, AI, and other artifacts. Social scientists since the mid-1940s have demonstrated that human beings will accord social standing and status to objects. This tendency is often denigrated and dismissed as anthropomorphism, but anthropomorphism might not be a bug. It is also a feature. It is the feature of human sociality. Protecting these social relationships and ensuring they are adequately recognized and respected could require that robots or AI have some claim to social status beyond that of a mere instrument. 
not because of a how it may or may not feel, but because of what we and our social institutions require. Now, this debate concerning the moral and the legal status of robots, AI, and other artifacts has exploded with activity in the last five years. This is what I call the concept map of the recent publications generated in this domain. As you can see, it's divided into different domains. On the one side, there are those who argue that this entire issue is unthinkable, a distraction, or a waste of time and effort. On the other side, there are those who are calling for innovations and new ways of thinking and addressing the opportunities and the challenge of this other form of socially significant otherness by rethinking how we decide matters of moral and legal status. And down the center in the region I call the is ought variations, you have various efforts to mobilize existing ways of thinking in order to respond to and organize responsibility in the face of these challenges. Now, wherever you find yourself on this map, one thing is clear. Robots, AI, and other kinds of artifacts are not just another thing to be easily accommodated to existing moral and legal categories. What we see in the face or the faceplate of the robot is a reflection of fundamental challenges to existing ways of deciding questions regarding social standing and status. Consequently, the right question entails that we not only consider the rights of others, but that we also learn how to ask the right questions about rights, their social function, and their consequences. So does this mean that, that robots, AI, or even one particular robot or AI can or should have moral or legal status? At this point in time, I believe we cannot answer the question with a, a definitive yes or no. What I do know is we need to engage this matter directly and with facts in hand, because how we come to think about rights and their distribution will have lasting consequences for us and others. Ultimately, the question of the standing of robots and AI is not a question about machines. It's a question about us about the integrity and sustainability of our social relationships with others and with other forms of otherness, including animals, the natural environment, and yes, even artifacts. So that's all I have. I just wanted to at least get the range of things that need to be described and discussed on the table, um, kind of reiterating what uh, Ben has already said about the question of uh, legal personality and the role that plays in society. But uh, hopefully this gives us a place uh, to you know, just explore this further and develop our thoughts on these matters. So thanks. Thank you. That was wonderful. And uh, so uh, should we go back to Ben now and, and get some of his responses to various points that you made? Sure. Well, there's that it raises a lot of really interesting questions. And um, I think we, one of the things that we clearly agree on is that the current state of technology um, doesn't support the notion that robots are creatures like us that experience the world and have moral status. Um, that make that day may come, but we're not there yet. Um, no matter what no matter the fact that there is this robot called Sophia, which has gotten uh, citizenship in Saudi Arabia, um, but that just seems to be a, a, a basically a cute trick. Um, it's it's it, it it says it makes recorded comments. Um, one question that one might ask: There's a movie called Office Space where um, about the difficulty, I mean, the, the problems of working in a standard office. And there's a scene in that movie where they take a fax machine, a bunch of people take a fax machine out in the middle of a field and they beat it and destroy it with baseball bats. Now, nobody would argue that a, that a fax machine is um, a robot or is in any way a person but this scene is actually troubling. <laughs> and so <clears throat> some scientists have, have, I mean, some psychologists particularly have taken versions of that by taking like toy dinosaurs or something else, which is clearly not a human, not a human, not a person, not anything. It's not, doesn't move or anything like this. And then telling someone, to take a hammer and just smash it to pieces. And people have a great deal of trouble doing that. Um, and so 
I think this notion that we anthropomorphize objects um, is, um, is a very important point, that we look at objects in the world and we accord them moral status, even though we know that they don't actually strictly deserve it. Um, I know people who <clears throat> sing happy birthday to their cars every thousand miles. Um, <clears throat> And they know perfectly well that the car doesn't um, <clears throat> sense this or appreciate it. Now, if we take that office space example, and there's another TV show called Westworld, which I have deliberately decided not to watch, but I'm working based on the descriptions that I've heard. Um, <clears throat> this contains this is a science fiction environment that contains humanoid robots that present as humans. And humans are able to come to this environment and do terrible things to those robots. And again, they are, they are clearly demonstrated as machines, but these machines are sentient creatures that have minds and can carry on social relations. Uh, <clears throat> and the fictional environment says it's okay in this environment to destroy these things and to behave in a beastly way. And so <clears throat> one of the questions one might ask is, is this a problem? I think a lot of us would say yes. And why is it a problem? And is it a problem because of the damage that it does to the person who destroys the machine? Is it a problem because of the, the damage to the machine? This, and so this connects back with damaging a, um, damaging a fax machine. There's someone in the waiting room, by the way. I don't know why this came up on my screen. Um, <clears throat> the an aspect of this is that in the view of ethics that I'm developing, the role of trust and trustworthiness is very important. And um, it strikes me that when a person damages a machine in a in a sort of cruel way that seems heartless. <clears throat> that that demonstrates untrustworthiness on the part of that human. So even if the, <clears throat> the machine has no moral status, even if it doesn't suffer any problem from the abuse it's being given, um, it still <clears throat> does damage to the moral status of the human who does that work, who does that takes those actions. Um, so I would say we look at situations like that and we look at the intentions that people have when they have when they perform those behaviors and we judge them based on that. And I do think that this is related to what the philosopher Dan Dennett calls the intentional stance. And I'm sure David not understands that stuff much better than I do. But let me pause here. <clears throat> You're muted, David. Oh, could, I inter could I interrupt? I'm just doing yeah. a little check. We have someone named Rafesticon. Could you please introduce yourself? Rufesticon, hello. Well, if they're not able to introduce themselves, I think I will let them go. Okay. Wait, wait. Have it removed. Okay, so they are removed. I don't, when someone joins, then I don't know who they are or where they came from. Yeah. You know, and I, now I have to get rid of this report. Don't report. I'll just say don't report. I'll assume it was a mistaken entry and not a malicious. Okay. 
continue, <laughs> whoever. So I, I'll just uh, say two things in response to what Ben just said. Um, first, this uh, item he mentioned about beating up the uh, fax machine. Um, there's a whole area of social scientific research now called robot abuse studies. And it's been going on for about 10 years. And what the social scientists do is they get a robot and they invite some human subjects into the lab and they ask the human subjects to torture, beat, or destroy the robot. And as Ben reported, uh, the work that Kate Darling has done and Robert Kahn and um, Christoph, um, oh, what's his last name? Um, I forget now. Uh, but th these people have actually documented that this there's this reticence on the part of human subjects to inflict uh, pain, in quotation marks, on the object. Um, and it has less to do with what they think it feels and more to do with us and the inhibitions that we have to uh, engage in that kind of activity. The second thing uh, that Ben was mentioning about uh, the way in which this reflects on the character of the human being, uh, this is Kant's indirect duties ar argument, right? Uh, back. Um, when Immanuel Kant was de developing his ethics, uh, Kant was not much of an animal ethics person, but he did say kick dogs because when you kick dogs, it reflects poorly on the human being uh, who engages in that activity. And it, it, it sort of is a corruption of our moral fiber. And so he had this indirect approach to animal rights or at least animal protection. And like Kate Darling and a few others have actually extended Kant's indirect duties argument to <clears throat> And AI and said, the reason why we don't engage in these kinds of uh, violent behaviors towards the object is that we are stopping ourselves because of this worry about what kind of cultivation it's going to make for the human being. Uh, if we behave violently towards these objects, it might make us more corrupt um, in our sort of moral character. And uh, it's a rather compelling argument and it's one that's been used rather effectively uh, to address these problems and uh, develop some kind of solution to uh, engaging in these uh, questions. Yeah, I agree completely. So if something if if something which <clears throat> is a unquestionably a machine, but it presents itself, as a sympathetic human being, then <clears throat> if you are willing to abuse it or destroy it, what does that say about you? Mm -hmm. Terrible things. And I think the most recent example of this we have is this uh, debate that sort of blew up midsummer with uh, the Google engineer, Blake Lemoyne, who yeah. was interacting with Lambda, which is a large language model at Google, and made the claim that it was sentient because of yeah. the kinds of responses that it was able to make to his inquiries. And there was this massive Twitter debate and even uh, popular media debate about whether this guy was just crazy, whether um, you know he, he was, maybe investing too much in the object. Obviously, Google um, argued the quite opposite position, saying it's not a person, it's not sentient, it's just a thing. They uh, suspended him and eventually fired him uh, for his conduct. Um, but that debate, I think, puts on the table this tension between how we respond to these artifacts that engage in social behavior. And when they engage in social behaviors, do we accord them a kind of social status, or do we withhold it, as the argument would go uh, from Google's side, that it was just a thing and therefore not deserving of anything uh, regarding uh, social standing or status? Well, let, let me take the other side on that particular one, <clears throat> because I think it's very easy for people to interact with an intelligent system or what we call an intelligent system and personify it. Um, so one of the very earliest chatbots, probably the very earliest chatbot is something called Eliza. And <clears throat> it was written by a guy named Joe Weizenbaum and published in 1963. Um, and it had a script that behaved like a therapist and it <clears throat> had 
if you say something like, I'm feeling tired today, it would take that sentence and trans just tr turn it around, flip the signs of the pronouns, and it would say things like, <clears throat> why are you feeling tired today? And or tell me more about you are feeling tired today. Um, now, the technology behind it was very simple, was thoroughly described in the journal article. And as a matter of fact, I would assign it to undergraduate students to implement so that they could see this work. But <clears throat> one of the things that he discovered is that people, even people who are very sophisticated and knew what this program was doing, could get um, completely wrapped up in interacting with this device. And he talks about a visitor from the Soviet Union who had come to visit his lab and sat down and started typing back and forth with Eliza. And he noticed that after an hour had gone by, he was still typing in, um, <clears throat> in, in very, very much. And he was having quite an intimate conversation about how long he'd been on the road, how much he missed his family, how lonely he was feeling, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and Weizenbaum was very concerned that people can construct a model of this other agent <clears throat> and treat it as though it understands vastly more than it does. And so there's a book I recommend, which <clears throat> is this book by Joe Weizenbaum, uh, published in, I think, 1976. Um, and I strongly recommend, if you're not familiar with it, you should get it. Um, <clears throat> and it talks about the potential for misestimating things you're interacting with. <clears throat> um, and so if you were talking to a person, and this, this happens nowadays when you pick up the phone a lot, so you, you get somebody who says, um, how are you this morning? And <clears throat> very quickly you discover that it's a fundraising call and that it's mostly consisting of, um, uh, it, it mostly consists of, of tape fragments, um, but it's designed to respond to you. And you can say all sorts of things and you feel like maybe it's responding to you. Um, and that's a situation that I feel is more exploitation of the human by whoever built this system. And Joe Weizenbaum was concerned about that potential for exploitation. Over to you, David. Okay, I, I'm just making time if people have questions or comments. I, I don't want to, yeah. you know. Yes, yeah, so I was about to open it to questions and comments. Could I start? Would you mind? Sure. Okay. I recently went to a play called Sweat about, purportedly about steel workers, but it was written by an African American woman who's very upscale, but, you know, grew up in Manhattan. Her father's a psychologist and went to Harvard, but she's writing about steel workers. And her uh, whole point was that everything will be solved when the different races don't uh, scapegoat each other. And my point is, since I did grow up in a steel mill town, unlike the writer of that play, there's more to it and it involves the creator of the problem who were the globalizing steel companies. And that was hardly dealt with. So um, I'm thinking that maybe the interactions with robots and the Lud Luddism with them in some ways parallel these um, strained racial relations that were depicted in uh, this play by Lynn Notage, it's called Sweat about a, a declining Pennsylvania steel mill town where these people had been friends and you get the picture. So um, robots are, are in many ways another group that are competing for jobs. 
And do either of you have something to say about this in that uh, it, previously it had been human on human, uh, one side coming in who'd been oppressed trying to work and they're called scabs and the others, you know, how does this fit into that? So, I mean, this, this is an old part of the story, right? I mean, the notion of the robot as servant or even slave goes all the way back to Chopik because robota mm -hmm. in Czech means forced labor. And so the robots of Karl uh, Chopik's uh, original play, R.U.R., uh, were positioned as servants that were forced into labor. And then there's an uprising. So it, it really is a standard sort of slave uprising story just told in the guise of a science fiction uh, play. But it turns out that this notion of servitude and, and slavery is reiterated in almost every science fiction portrayal of robots since that time. I mean, uh, Ben mentioned the uh, episode with Data in Star Trek The Next Generation. And part of that uh, entire episode is about whether Data can be possessed as a piece of property by the Federation, or whether Data is his own independent person with his own set of rights and responsibilities. And that's that tension between person and thing. Interestingly, or perhaps disturbingly, depending on how you want to look at it, a lot of legal scholars have suggested that the way to deal with the challenge of robots isn't to declare them persons, isn't to declare them things. So resist both reification on the one hand and personification on the other hand, but create a new legal category. And that new legal category, they say we can borrow from the Roman slave laws. So what they try to do is actually update slavery. They've introduced slavery 2.0 under this sort of legal framework of providing another ontological category that is neither a person nor a thing, because robots, like the slave of Rome, could engage in transactions of a commercial nature um, and execute contracts. But on the other hand, we're not um, free citizens. Like the, could I could uh, I Roman interject person. here? This is not going the way I meant it to go. I'm trying to ask if there's personhood and agency among the humans who are being competed with by the robots. I'm not concerned about what we call the robots and their status. It's it's all it's all centered on them. What I would like to talk about is what about the people who are having to face this group that's getting all the attention, all the, the consideration one way or another, and the humans are sort of treated like broccoli on this whole discussion we've been having. So I would like to know what, you know, if you have any of you tried to see it from the subjective perspective of the human beings who are being competed against with all these fancy protections being written in. And of course, they're being written into the benefit of the owners of the companies. They are not being writ written in to protect any of the human workers. And I find this very disturbing that even in this, con in this con um, discussion, it, we're not ever looking at it from the perspective of the human workers. Can you do that? Is that possible? And that's my question. Oh, I think so very much. And so I would... <clears throat> actually like to encourage you to go back. I think I sent in um, pointers to some of my previous papers on this. And one of them is called Trust and Cooperation. Um, that trying to think of what ethics does for society. Part of the claim that I wanna make is that members of society um, need to have some degree of trust and need to be able to evaluate whether, to determine whether others are trustworthy, the other members in the society. And we can talk about robots and whether they are trustworthy and, are, and should be trusted, but actually corporations and other humans are much more dominant agents in our society and the question of whether they are trustworthy and can be trusted as cooperative partners um, is, <clears throat> is a much bigger question. And so um, one of the things one would like to be able to trust if you are a worker in a society um, is that you will have work and you will be paid for your work so that you can support yourself and your family. Um, 
And I believe that with all of the technological developments that we're seeing, um, we're actually creating a great deal more wealth than the society has ever had. There's a lot of very comprehensive economics about this that show that the net, the total wealth of our society has been increasing substantially. Um, the problem is the distribution of that wealth and the way it's being used in, <clears throat> and who is being exploited with that. Um, but I think that there is, it's at least theoretically possible to say we will create work for any human being who wants it. Um, and <clears throat> we could create a society that um, provides work, provides um, pay for that work, provides a number of resources like healthcare and retirement funding and education. Um, that don't depend on work. Um, right now, since the last several hundred years, we've had public education. So for elementary school and then high school, um, the, the society pays for the education of children. Um, now, not everybody takes advantage of that, but it's, it's basically considered a benefit. Now, in our in <clears throat> healthcare, um, actually, let me do retirement first, because our society decided 70 or 80 years ago that Social Security would be something that would meet that would prevent um, many elder people from just dying in poverty. Now, we can argue about whether Social Security is adequate, but we've created a way that uses some degree of the wealth of the society to help people's retirement. Healthcare, um, in many countries in Europe, healthcare is provided to everybody in the society independent of um, their situation or, or work. Um, in the United States, um, that's much, much less true. Um, so, but, it would be possible given the wealth that we're creating through our technology um, to commit to creating jobs for everybody because jobs are arguably a valuable thing to have even separately from the fact that they generate paychecks that allow you to pay the rent. That being involved in meaningful effort um, is an intrinsically valuable thing. Now, obviously, we're not there yet, but I think this is something, um, if we're thinking about robots acting as decision-making agents in our society, we should also be asking about what other non-human decision-making agents are effectively members of our society. And I think corporate entities, many of which are for-profit corporations, but there's also governments and churches and other, um, other collective entities that are also decision-making agents. We could refer the, to them as AIs if we wanted to. They're partly made of humans, but they are not the same as humans. And they perform they, they actually hold much of the wealth of our society. Uh, so we should be thinking about all of these agents and the roles that they can play as members of society. So I would agree with you. That was a great response. <laughs> Thank, oh, you. Thank you. I would just add that, you know, we used to think that technological unemployment and the pressures of technological unemployment through automation meant the industrial manufacturing jobs that were dull, dirty, and dangerous. Uh -huh. uh, today, the jobs that are uh, at least at the greatest threat of being automated are the jobs that are information-based and some sort of repetitive uh, routine activity. 
So we can see already how journalists can be displaced by algorithms that write original news stories. We can see how artists are being displaced by Dolly and Midjourney and other image generation uh, systems that are um, circulating currently. And we can see how the work in law, um, a lot of the discovery that is done in legal practice is now done by algorithms. And so I think the jobs that we used to think were immune to uh, being automated into non-existence are actually um, jobs that we've got to be a little more attentive to because the algorithms are coming not just for the manufacturing jobs, but for a lot of the so-called good white collar jobs. And I think that's a brand new uh, pressure on our economic system. Anybody else have something to say? Also a good point, by the way, yes. Well, usually Bob has something to say on these things. I'm surprised he hasn't chimed in. Oh, I did, and I have something to say. I just think we have um, a long way to go. I know I had a um, me talking about you know automation replacing jobs, etc. I had um, a problem with Amazon yesterday, <laughs> and I <laughs> I called up to get it resolved, and they had automatic you know if you say this you're going to get this response. Blah blah blah. Um, I finally ended up screaming. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I need to talk to a rep. I need to talk to a rep because they had me going around in circles. <laughs> so um, they just, uh, there's a long way to go before they get that resolved. Nancy, I think you're muted. Okay, when I look at people getting paid for what they do and being replaced. And there are people looking at providing a living wage or even better than living wage for existing. If we have machines who can do a lot of what we used to consider work. And if there is there's some basis for this, because there's probably nothing wrong with having a machine do work that we don't have to think or can't add value to performing. But what do we do? <laughs> and we still need to support ourselves and have medical care and feed our families, et cetera. And I, I think there's something to be looked at at the other side of, of what needs to be provided for us. And I'm not necessarily sure it means, well, let's just let people keep doing jobs that machines could do better so they can make a living. And we may have to look at other strategies for how we want people uh, to take care of themselves or to be taken care of or whatever, because the the metrics in the world are changing and where we're going is, is changing. And I don't know that we don't stop it. Uh, I think the corporations where they're going is, is getting actually a little dangerous. And I don't know how we control that either, having retired from a mega company and seeing how some of it works, which is a little scary. Uh, they're actually on our retirement website asking if you want to provide any stories about if you've been asked to do unethical things. Uh, there were a couple of times I, I worked in systems when you were asked to do things that, well, fortunately, I never had to do. But uh, corporate management could be very creative <laughs> in what they often wanted, wanted you to look at, especially if you were, I was reporting on profitability at the time. But uh, but looking going forward, I, I'm not sure we have answers yet. I'm not even sure we've asked the question. And it's just a lot of people seem to be suffering and not getting much of anything out of all this advancement we've made. And it, is, it really doesn't seem right. Uh, I'm one of the lucky ones. I worked in computers back when you actually had to do assembler code and all that kind of fun stuff. And uh, and it paid well back then. And I'm not sure they need people like me to do that anymore. <laughs> they have machines who can do that quite well these days. And uh, it, it's, there's some open invitations here about where we have to take care of people. 
And I don't think we've addressed that issue or even faced that issue. We're always assuming a new job will come up. Well, maybe a new job is different than what we meant by the old jobs to be. And, uh, you know, my mind is I enjoy consuming consumables, which is what I'm doing in retirement, which may not be productive, but I'm sure it gives work to a lot of people who are. So, uh, you know, and I support charities and that I think helps a lot of people, but still there's a lot that needs to be addressed. And I, I don't want to slow down the development of machines, but we don't want to put them in charge and we need to take care of the people somehow. And we're not addressing it at all. See, I would argue that part of the problem is we have accepted a framing of our economy as optimizing certain measures, and in particular, optimizing profit. Um, and that has resulted in designing um, large corporations and making practical decisions within large corporations in order to maximize profit. And I think if what we want to do is to maximize the welfare of our society and of the human beings within it, that's going to require a different formulation of the problem. But this particular profit oriented view has been pushed since about the 1970s and 1980s. Before that, I think people had very much more of an attitude that, um, that the economy was to support the people. Um, now, they, they weren't necessarily very egalitarian about that. Um, but Starting in the 70s and 80s, what we got was people like Milton Friedman, who published a very influential article that yeah. um, opposing the social responsibility of business movement. And the title of his article was, the social responsibility of business is to maximize its profits. Mm -hmm. And that was extraordinarily influential. And I think it, it has driven a lot of the things that have gone on in our economy. And it's one of the reasons why we get um, the oppression of the worker. So one of the things that Ben had mentioned earlier is about wealth redistribution, that there is wealth in the economy. It's a matter of how it's distributed around. Mm -hmm. And we can look at work as one mechanism and one strategy for the redistribution of wealth. Mm -hmm. And if indeed the jobs are not there, or if they're being replaced or automated out of existence, then the question becomes what other redistribution strategies may be implemented uh, for the benefit of the populace. And one proposal that's been around for a while and it's been tested now in a number of different smaller communities is universal basic income. This idea that everybody would receive a universal basic income on a monthly basis and that would be administered as a wealth redistribution program by governments. And mm -hmm. this has not been rolled out on any large scale, but it's been experimented with in smaller um, sites uh, citywide or statewide. And the results seem to be rather positive in terms of what it encourages. Um, but this is really in the beginning stages, and the only political traction it's had in the U.S. is, if you remember, Andrew Yang, when he was running uh, for president, had actually mentioned UBI as part of his uh, initial platform. Mm -hmm. And it's it's interesting to note that there are some cases where they don't talk about it that way. But, for example, the state of Alaska has a very interesting deal because the state receives a large fraction of the royalties from the oil that's pumped in Alaska. And one of the things that they've done with that is that they make a payment to every citizen of the state of Alaska, which is a number of thousands of dollars per year. So it's, it's effectively um, a universal basic income. It's, it's, I don't think it's quite enough to live on but it certainly supplements what you're doing. Um, and 
I don't think they had intended this to be a, a, an income redistribution method, but the people at the time realized they had this enormously valuable oil. They were needing to strike a deal with the companies that wanted to pump the oil. And so they needed to set up a scheme for distributing the royalties. Um, and they actually hit on something that was pretty good. So I think when you add it on top of the um, experimental deployments of UBI that David was talking about, I think we have evidence that this is actually um, a very viable way to redistribute wealth. And when you look at some of the countries that like rate high on like the happiness index, it's yeah. Mm -hmm. Happen to be a lot of places where there's a lot of redistribution. And yeah. our country is one of the worst. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we really are in terms of maternal care and in terms of support for the poor and the homeless. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're definitely nothing to be proud of in, in that regard. And I, I really don't quite understand how we fit in that, <laughs> how we let the country get away with it. Yes. Now, it's also worth noting that <clears throat> I don't believe that all of the jobs are vulnerable to being taken over by automation and robotics. For example, childcare is very, very difficult or probably impossible to do by robot. Um, and now the economics of childcare is such that it's, it's very difficult within our current economy to, to, to pay the childcare workers a living wage while making it affordable to the parents who are paying for the childcare. So this is a process that needs the same kind of subsidy that we're talking about. And as, as all of us here are thoroughly aware of, Elder care is another case um, where we're getting the same thing, that as people age and ideally get to age in place in our comfortable homes, we're going to need more support. There are people who do that work. They are, tend to be very poorly paid. They have very little security. Um, if we're thinking about ways to change the nature of, of our economy, we could arrange things to pay these people much better and get better quality work. And for many people, this kind of personal care work is very satisfying. But it's very satisfying if it's adequately compensated. Mm -hmm. You'd like In to be able to eat. Yes. Yeah. And so I think I think that there is a perfectly clear path. The, the problem is that it violates a number of assumptions that have been widely accepted about what it means to have a job and where the money has to come from in order to pay the workers for that job. And I think we have to we have to rethink those things. We also have to recognize that uh, employment is also a moral item in the United States and elsewhere across the world that being unemployed is somehow considered detrimental, right? And it's something mm -hmm. to be embarrassed about. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to change the conversation about how we recognize our own worth and our own identities apart mm -hmm. from the occupations and the careers that we occupy. And I don't know that we have um, within our cultural language a way of describing these things just yet because those items are so tied up with work that um, we really identify with our position and with our career. And that becomes a very important uh, component of individual identity that uh, needs now to somehow be disengaged from that um, in ways that yeah. uh, really is abrasive to our cultural way of understanding who we are. I'll tell you when you address it, it's when you look to retirement. Mm -hmm. I was with the company and I, we were looking for it and I retired in year 2000 and fortunately could afford to and was young at retirement. But 
what does it mean to lose that title? Mm -hmm. Going into New York and having an important job and people that came to you for problems and whatever. And you'd had that for years and you're not going to have that anymore. Right. And you have to really face what are you going to do with your life? Are you going to enjoy it? Will you be satisfied? I, I happen to like traveling and reading and other things. So mm -hmm. you made the adjustment, but you have, have to realize you give something up and it's the reward you got from working. And they're not insignificant. And you spent a lot of years working your way up the ladder to get those rewards. And I think people, until it's the end of their career, never really address what they're going to do with the rest of their lives that's not tied to work. And it's something maybe we should look at more fully and not tie everything so much to our jobs, which I had a husband who reminded me of that with some frequency. <laughs> <laughs> 25 years ago uh that it would be nice to see you at home now and then and uh, i think i think that probably was a good idea at the time but uh and i think maybe more of the society needs to have that question that too many people are working too many hours for too little reward i have nieces in the healthcare field and this is very difficult to get much rewards for despite the value Speaking of fields you can't really replace. So it's well, this is getting quite a long way from robots, but yes. um, I do think that um, it is valuable to be able to define one's work post-retirement as still serving some need. That there are needs in the world um, it's nice to be able to serve them in ways that help other people and don't necessarily, well, as, as we get older, we're a little less able to spend the kind of 60 hour a week focused attention that we were once upon a time. But there's, <clears throat> there are, are opportunities to do um, valuable things that help others. And I think the there's a lot of evidence that being focused on helping other people um, contributes um, disproportionately to one's quality of life. And robots, I don't think, share that. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Yeah. Are there any more uh, comments or ideas, questions? I have a, I'm gonna pop this into the chat because there are kind of robots in this novel. It's just a reference to a very interesting society created in the 1950s, this novel. Oh no, maybe it came out a little later, but you can check. Uh -huh. It's called Gladiator. Gladiator. Well, I'm not wow. sure if it, have hmm. you read that, Ben? I have not actually. It's, not. it's very good. And it's oh, about, wow. uh, you know, where the corporate person and, and all of these hierarchical structures take over and and people are then made to fit, you know, the, you have a square peg and you're made to fit in the round hole. And especially if you irritate or inconvenience any of these upper level people. So uh, we're having a, this is a little off topic, but we're having a, a discussion group at TuscCon, our local fan run science fiction convention in the early November 4th, I think. And it's going to be called Income Inequality in Science Fiction. And that is something that has never been a panel item at any world convention or any convention that I know of. And they did it at the world convention in Chicago. And so I got a bunch, a whole bunch of references about all these issues where robots are coming in and um, being used, being instrumentalized to throw people out and make people redundant. And they never seem to understand it until you read something like RUR that, that everyone, no one is irreplaceable, not even the top guy. Mm -hmm. So that's mine. Yeah, Player Piano by Kurt Vonnegut is another one um, written in 1952. And he's, um, he, he noticed, um, um, Machine tools. Uh, 
sort of mechanically controlled machine tools. There was another thread, and I'm sure we don't have time to, to pursue this, but mm, people often think that something has moral status if it is sentient and conscious. Mm -hmm. And so we believe, we're pretty sure that we ourselves are sentient and conscious based on our own experience of, of, of being here. Um, it's philosophers spend a certain amount of time saying that we can't really know that the rest of you out there are sentient and conscious or are you just <laughs> pretending to be. Um, <clears throat> but as a matter of, of sort of social courtesy, we treat each other as though everybody else is sentient and conscious <laughs> too. And it's a strong tendency, which people have brought up in some of the things people have said earlier, to treat machines that way as well. Um, now, I think in science fiction, there have been some explorations of what it might be like to be a robot. So I'm thinking of things like Martha Wells' Murderbot Diaries. Have, have you guys read those? I'm sure you have. Oh, it's worth reading. It's really interesting. I think she's won a bunch of awards about it. Um, there's also an interesting one um, called, uh, it's, it's a short story by Naomi Kritzer called Cat Pictures, Please, about a sentient um, uh, sort of internet bot that basically lives on cat pictures. Um, <clears throat> and, but movies like Her and Robot and Frank, uh, David had a, had a slide with that on it, um, and Terminator 2 also explore some things about what it's like to actually be a robot or be an artificially intelligent entity, like Her, who is, not an embodied robot, but is a, an, an, a computational entity that can have relationships. Uh, <clears throat> now, philosophers have explored this. There's a famous paper by uh, Robert Nagel called, um, What is it like to be a bat? Um, <clears throat> and the argument that I have heard is that to tell whether some, some creature is sentient is that there should be something that it is like to be that creature. Although that, as a criterion, it's a little curious to know whether that would even help because um, lots of creatures, it might be like something to be that creature, but it certainly wouldn't be able to express it. So, it's, it's not that that kind of creature can defend itself on the grounds of being sentient by, by explaining what it's like, because bats can't explain that sort of thing. Um, but that part of the treating somebody else courteously by assuming that they're sentient and conscious is to assume that there is something like to be that sort of creature. Um, so from a philosophical point of view, and I'm, I'm curious as to what David thinks about this, um, I'm, I'm not sure that this, what is it to be, what is it like to be X is actually a helpful thing to ask. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree. I, I think this whole phenomenal consciousness thing uh, that comes out of Nagel is, uh, it's an attempt to solve a problem, but I think the solution is partial at best. And I think your comment about how would it ever express itself as such, I think it factors very heavily into that uh, determination. So I, I would tend to agree, yeah. So we have language, but plenty of things that are sentient that can actually experience, experience sensations, positive and negative, are not don't have language so they can't and so where, where things get really complicated and interesting is when you have artifacts that have language 
right? Like yeah. large language models. Right. <laughs> then the question becomes, so they can manipulate language. They can seemingly express themselves. And so what do we do with that capability? And I think that's where um, Turing began because he says mm -hmm. you can't define machine or intelligence. All you can do is go on behavioral um, evidence on, and behavioral evidence in this case was conversational interpersonal interaction. Mm -hmm. And that's what Weizenbaum was working with, with Eliza. And that's what Lemoyne uh, was trying to grapple with, um, with, you know, when he got into the whole thing with Lambda. And so I think we're confronting this idea now that we have things that talk. And mm -hmm. that is a brand new challenge to uh, not only human exceptionalism, but the way we uh, decide a lot of these questions. And how do you tell when they're just pretending to understand? They're not understanding, they're just pretending to understand. Now, we have this model of conversations. Like, here we are having these discussions, and we're actually pretty confident that we are understanding most of what the other people are saying and the other people are understanding much of what we are saying and that we're sort of grappling together with some ideas and that's sort of the ideal of what a conversation ought to be on the other hand i think almost everybody has been has had the experience of being in a party or something like this where you're talking to somebody and you really you really have no idea what they're talking about and and more or less out of courtesy you sort of say oh yeah 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 oh that's really interesting oh yeah oh, tell me more um <clears throat> and you're just pretending there actually is not a conversation going on and this is one of the ways I mean, humans do interact with each other this way, sometimes. It may not be the ideal, but it does happen. And it, 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 it makes you sort of, it, it sheds a little bit of interesting light on, um, on, on some of these questions of um, what it means to sort of pretend to be understanding because we actually do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, are there studies of that phenomenon where people pretend to be understanding? Lots. <laughs> well, really, because I saw a lot of, I want to tell you again about this play. A lot of people- My students are always pretending to be understanding. A lot of people, <laughs> okay. There is that. Yes. Excuse me. A lot of people in the audience were, were, I think, pretending to be understanding of these steel workers in that play because they were from a far more privileged background, and they kind of watched the the scuffling between the white workers and the black workers, and and they were very understanding. But then I felt they went back to their own um, private worlds away from these people but they pretended to be understanding. And I would love to see some studies on that. Mm. There's like three decades of, of uh, documented social scientific research in the field of communication studies, which looks at interpersonal communication and understandability, uh, trust and deception. And so this has been going on for decades. Uh, there's, you know, I, I can point you to all kinds of things if you're interested. Um, it's I'm not very most, interested. Yeah, it's not, it's not the most interesting of reading because these are uh, experimental uh, studies, but uh, the findings are, are pretty insightful. No, I can read that. I used to grade papers in all different fields when I taught writing in college, so I can I can manage. But yeah, yeah I'll, could, I'll send them along. Yes, yeah, send them along. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in that too, David. Okay. Well, um, have we run to run to our course? And everyone has asked whatever. Of course, you know that you can also contact our speakers in future. Sometimes it's hard to come up with things during the meeting and then you kick yourself oh if i'd only thought to ask that but i'm sure no one would object if you think of a good one and want to ask our speakers at a later time and uh, they're out there you can go to their faculty pages and find contact info on them that would be fine and, yeah and i i appreciate that you're both so accessible and willing to 
talk about some of these are very painful issues, although our language is, is more formal, but I mean, when these things are actually happening, it's very painful. So I wanna thank you for getting to some areas that usually aren't even covered either in regular society or even in science fiction. So anybody else wanna make some closing statement or comment? I see people applauding, <laughs> one, one person. <laughs> so um, this was a good one. And I, I've been actually writing some of your comments in Facebook and telling people as this was ongoing, you, you're missing this guys, come on. So you'll probably get a lot of watches on YouTube because I've been raving about how good this was. So thank Great. you very much. And uh, we will probably bring you back maybe as a team, you know, because it's so good, yeah. like as an update once a year or something, if you can do it. You yeah. all think so, everybody? You like that idea? Yeah, thumbs yeah. Up. So, thumbs up. Yeah, okay. A lot, lot, lot of, lot of cool, yeah, we go in a lot of different directions when there's, uh, when there's uh, uh, two interacting speakers. Right, right. It really helped a lot. And because you complement yeah. each other's skill sets. So once again, I want to thank everybody for being here. And uh, in lieu of anyone else, you have your chance now. Speak now or as they say, you know. <laughs> but you don't have to forever hold your peace. <laughs> you don't have to. No. Thanks, speakers. Good, good to see. Good to see. Right. Thank you for inviting us. Yes, thank you all for your questions. Well, it's been a pleasure. Yes, that was really, thank you really interesting. Yeah. yeah and save right. these and share share the YouTube when I get it uploaded with friends. If you like this, um, we always could use more attendees, and and that might draw some more people. So, thank you all for coming. And now off to the rest of your day. <laughs> thank you, Gloria. Thank you. You're very welcome. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye.